Hello, and welcome to the North Asia Cape Need to Know series. I'm Amber Older. The North Asia Cape is committed to helping New Zealand businesses internationalize in China, Japan, and Korea. As part of this work, we're proud to host the inaugural North Asia Cape Fellow. He is Professor David Shambaugh of the George Washington University in the United States. Professor Shambaugh is internationally renowned for his knowledge and analysis of contemporary China. He joins me now to discuss China's changing global footprint. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Your 2013 book, China Goes Global, looked at uh, China's global footprint, essentially. Where are we at with that today? Uh, the footprint has continued to broaden, um, particularly in Latin America um, and in Central Europe, from the Baltics down to the Balkans. That's uh, four, five years ago, China hardly had any presence in those countries. Now they have what they call the 16 plus one arrangement, the 16 Central European countries plus the one is China. That is a separate arrangement, aside from the China-EU arrangement. Of course, not all of these Central European countries are members of the EU. And there are former communist you know, states uh, that, of course, have enjoyed their independence in the post-communist period, but they're economically not nearly as well developed as the West European states. So China has seen a lot of economic opportunity, and there's need in these countries. It's kind of the Belt and Road argument. They need infrastructure. Um, and, you know, the European company, West European companies are trying to compete in that space, but China's come in uh, to Central Europe in a big way. So that's, that's one change. Middle East is another change. We see just in the last two years, really, China's footprint across the Gulf states um, deepening, again, commercial footprint, but also diplomatic footprint. And since the Iran nuclear accord was signed, uh, China has uh, reasserted itself, I should say, uh, with a vengeance in Iran across many spheres, including the military sphere. So that's an area where China has broadened its footprint. Um, its image globally, however, has declined over the last five years. It continues to be mixed, and you really have to go region by region. It's more positive in some places than other places. Um, but uh, it's, there's been a secular trend globally of a, of a decline of 10 percentage points of the so-called favorability ratings. Um, so even in Africa, where China is very popular and had enjoyed 80 percent plus favorability ratings, many African countries have fallen down now into the 60s or, or lower. There's a lot of concern amongst African countries about the Chinese uh, commercial presence, the infrastructure projects, the labor issues, Chinese labor being brought in to build infrastructure. So, you know, China's encountering pushback, I think it's fair to say. It shouldn't be surprising. Um, and as we see Belt and Road rolled out further, they are going to encounter more pushback in different countries. We've already seen it in Sri Lanka, for example, Myanmar, a couple of others. So, you know, um, all is not smooth going for any power. Um, and sh this is all new for China. China's never been a global power before. It's been an Asian regional power. But now it's operating literally everywhere on the planet. And it's going to encounter uh, difficulties in, in many places. The most difficult relationship for China today, well, it has to be said, their diplomacy overall, I would say, is, is quite good. I mean, they, they're having pushback on commercial issues and on military security issues, but their diplomacy is very adroit, and they have good relations with most countries. Um, so that's, that's a success element, and I would g give them credit for increasing their contributions to so-called global governance. That's a, a term that international relations specialists use to define uh, contributions to global public goods, whether it's peacekeeping operations or humanitarian disaster relief or UNESCO um, or budgets for the UN um, and other multilateral organizations. China, up until 2012, when Xi Jinping came to power, it's fair to say, had been a free rider uh, and had was contributing not proportionate to its size of its economy or the size of its country. They had been called out on that by various um, foreign foreigners. Uh, you might remember the American uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Robert Zellick, who called on them to become a responsible international stakeholder um, back in 2004. Well, today I think we can say they are a responsible international stakeholder. They really upped their game under Xi Jinping. So he deserves, you know, five stars, I think, in the global governance front. Um, 
So lastly, I guess if you know you're looking at their global position, one has to take note um, of the U.S.-China relationship. And that is the most important relationship in international affairs, I would argue. These are the two major powers. Everybody else is affected by that relationship uh, to varying degrees. The relationship is quite poor. It's very, very strained. Even before the, tar the Trump tariffs, it was very strained. And it didn't happen overnight. It's happened over the last decade in the United States. The spectrum of opinion on China has completely shifted. Uh, to a much more, uh, well, to a more frustrated um, and assertive position on the part of every constituency in the United States. There are very few, if any, constituencies in America calling for cooperation and engagement with China. Quite to the contrary, everybody is for confronting China. Um, because we've tried to cooperate with the Chinese in many spheres for many years and tried to talk to them about the impediments of doing business in their country and other issues that are of concern to Americans and, indeed, other countries. And without a lot of progress, it has to be said. So there's a high quotient of frustration amongst Americans about China, and the relationship is really pretty strained, pretty dysfunctional. We're break, we've broken off the so-called strategic dialogues. And frankly, my own view is that this is very natural. It's the new normal. Everybody better get used to it. Um, but the real challenge for both the U.S. and China uh, is to manage the competition, uh, manage friction. You know, you have to recognize that friction is real. It exists for real reasons. You even need to embrace the friction. But you can manage it without it becoming adversarial. Uh, these two countries, it's not the Cold War yet. This is not China, or not the Soviet Union, the United States yet. Could go that way, but it's not yet. So it's going to take some real maturity, I hate to say, on both parties' part. And right now, the Chinese are acting in a more mature fashion than the Americans, you know, to keep this relationship from becoming fully antagonistic. Because when, if that were to happen, as they say in India, if the elephants fight, the grass is trampled. Everybody else, including New Zealand, will be affected. So every other country has a role to play, I'll just finish on this point, in trying to heal, you might say, the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, and part of the way to heal it is if you share views, you share the positions of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China, then coordinate with the United States. Don't go it alone. You know, we all have, I think, common interests vis-a-vis -vis China, both China's internal evolution and China's external evolution. So let's work together to help shape that. Professor David Shambaugh, thank you so much.